Well, a very warm welcome everybody to uh, this impact research webinar today. My name is Carrie Jackson and I'm Associate Professor for Practice Transformation and one of the directors of the Impact Research Group at UEA. And I'm joined by colleagues Professor Kim Manley and Professor Jonathan Webster and Emily Delver, who is helping us with our slides today. This session is being recorded. Um, so it's really important for the duration of the next hour that you keep your camera off and your microphone on mute. And please do use the chat function to ask any questions of John and Andre, and we will uh, uh, facilitate a discussion if we have time at the end. And there will be a recording of this available on our YouTube channel uh, for the end of this week. So it's my great delight today to introduce Professor Andre LeMay and Professor John Gabe, who are working as joint ARC implementation leads in the east of England. Andre uh, and John in that role have been responsible for helping to implement research and to develop the ARC's capacity for implementation. Andre's long-standing focus on research implementation began in 1986 as a specialist nurse for research and development which is a role that's created to move research into practice across NHS professional groups, specialities and organisations, staying close to practice through research, service development and education. She since then taught, mentored uh, postgraduate students in knowledge management and mobilisation, change management and clinical leadership. Her own research expertise focuses on developing and implementing, evaluating implementation techniques, especially communities of practice, and co-producing evidence-based practice and policy change and researching quality improvement skills. She's Professor Emeritus of Nursing at the University of Southampton, an honorary visiting senior fellow at the Institute of Public Health in Cambridge, editor-in-chief for the NIHR, uh, HS and DR programme, public health, global health and programme grants for applied research journals and co-editor of the Journal of Research in Nursing. John, who works closely with Andre as the Joint ARC Implementation Lead, um, graduated from medical school in 1974 from Manchester and spent several years in Cambridge researching and teaching on the social construction of medical knowledge in a historical context before specialising in public health. Whilst Foundation Director of the Wessex Institute at the University of Southampton between 92 and 2004, uh, which provided research-based intelligence to local health public health practitioners, he also directed the NHS National Coordinating Centre for Health uh, Technology Assessment. His research has mainly focused on the ways in which health professionals use research-based knowledge to inform their policy and practice, including with Andre, the development of the concept of clinical mind lines, which they'll be talking about today, which has become a widely cited way of understanding how clinicians are able to deal with the contextual complexities of care that are not amenable to published guidelines. He's Emeritus Professor of Public Health at the University of Southampton, Honorary Visiting Senior Visiting Fellow at the Institute for Public Health at the University of Cambridge and a senior member of the Darwin College in Cambridge. So I'm going to hand over to both Andre and John for their presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie. It's lovely to see so many um, round blobs, which I think are people on the screen. So welcome to our presentation. Um, today we're going to talk about how a theory-driven approach that we use at the Applied Research Collaboration in the East of England um, has brought about change in practice and policy. We'll talk to you for in, um, over half an hour and then hopefully there'll be some time for questions. If we don't have time for questions or all of your questions, we'll, we'll answer those by email or some other way. Um, so that you will get a chance to, to ask a question if you wish. So we'll head into our presentation now and just tell you the overarching aims of our implementation strategy in the ARC. There are, are three, um, using relational methods to implement research-based evidence, building implementation and ethos of implementation into all the research themes that the ARC um, holds, 
and also to build up a cadre of implementation savvy people. So it's about making a difference, um, building capacity and, and increasing, if, if you like, the presence of implementation and knowledge about implementation across our arc. But um, I just want to say we're talking about the implementation of research rather than implementation research, in case anybody gets confused by those two terms. And today we're going to focus on the relational methods that we use here to try to implement research-based evidence. So sometimes when we talk about implementation, people think it's really easy. It's something that, that can happen quite naturally without a lot of effort. And I hope by the end of today, or we hope by the end of today, that you'll feel that it's not quite so simple and that it would be naive to think that implementation of evidence in practice didn't have a theoretical underpinning. So those of you who can see it, and I hope you all can, here's a cartoon here of somebody who's a little bit naive, um, jumping out of a plane without a parachute and we're trying to say to you today that actually you need that parachute that theory um, driven parachute to help you implement research into practice better so here's our, our illustration for today or at least one of them it's a theory parachute helping research evidence land in the right place in, in organisations and in practice. And there are four elements to the theory that underpins our work here. There's what we call the four circles of change or four circles of, of um, implementation. The notion of mind lines, which um, Carrie's already alluded to, um, communities of practice, and also something that we call softs, which is some evidence that comes from some research we were doing for the Health Foundation about how improvements can happen well in practice. So here's the research evidence drifting beautifully down to earth in a very controlled manner. But the first thing we need to do is to make sure that that is the evidence that we want, that it's relevant, and it's rigorous and robust enough for us to be able to implement it to make sound changes to practice. The next thing we need to think about is where it's going to land. It's no good if it lands on um, a rocky landscape, if we were expecting a nice smooth grassy one. So we need to think about the context, the organisations into which that evidence is going to land. So the first two circles in our model are context and evidence. The next one obviously is the people that you're working with. Here we've called them target practitioners, but they could be anybody, any person that is going to benefit from this evidence. Patients, carers, families, organisations where people don't wish to be called practitioners, but who are still really important in ensuring that evidence can move into practice smoothly. And that takes us to the fourth circle, which is how we do it. How do we make that smooth transition from the box of stuff at the bottom of the parachute into a change in practice? And for us, mainly we use facilitation, as we see also in other models. And I think we've been talking about Paris a lot recently. Um, generally, Paris emphasises facilitation too. But other people use different strategies, um, much more managerial, a it would be best if we did it sort of approach rather than a discursive facilitative approach. All have their place if we're going to think through successful implementation. But these are the four things that we think you need to think about. Today we're going to be talking about theories, but I'm, I'm afraid to say that uh, most of the ones we're going to be talking about are actually ones that we've been involved in researching over the past 20 years or so. Um, so these are the main sources of our theory. And at the end of the talk, uh, when you look at the slides, uh, there'll be references that you can go to if you wish. Um, so a series of eight or nine studies that have kind of developed into a program of research all about how how you get research uh, into practice. The first and, and we need to thank our our sponsors over the years, which are NHS and Health Foundation and Joseph Roundtree and others. The 
first thing that we did in the year 2000 was to set up a community of practice to try to implement research um, in a group of people who included local citizens, uh, people from the local authority, people from the community services, from primary care, from hospitals. And the idea uh, by the uh, from the NHS R&D people was that we would provide them with research to inform policies that they were working on in the care of the elderly uh, and another project that Andre was involved in with another colleague in, in outpatients, um, ENT and other outpatients. And what we found was that when we gave them the research, instead of going through the nice linear thing that they usually do, they did this. You give them a piece of research and they bounce it around a group and anybody who's ever sat in a committee will will immediately recognize uh, these processes. This This slide, isn't just random, it was actually based on quite a lot of analysis of the data um, of watching these meetings and seeing what was actually going on at the time. And they will bounce stuff around and change it and lose it and forget it or switch it into something that they recognize more than the actual results of the research but makes more sense to them and so on. So that was our first concern. And then we thought, well, we better talk to some people who are actually practitioners rather than a multi-sectoral thing um, and see whether they also, like this group, used all these different sources of evidence. And indeed they did. There are many, many sources of evidence. We're trying to put in the research, and I can't even see it on this slide. Um, whereas what they're actually doing is basing it on their experience, on other people's experience, on what the local experts say, on what the reps have told them, what they've heard at conferences, and so on and so on, and what they pick up in newsletters. Many, many sources of evidence come together when we are making a decision about how to treat patients, how to organize services. Uh, one of the reasons we do this, and this was from another study where we were looking at um, uh, clinical commissioning groups, was to see how they use inf evidence to alter their policy. And the naive view is that you get an ed evidence based innovation, which has been demonstrated by systematic review or a nice guidance or something of that ilk. And you put it through the system and it comes out as an evidence based innovation in use. But when you actually watch what happened, as we did, what goes on is that it bounces around the system much in the way of that earlier whizzy, whizzy diagram I showed you. And what comes out at the end is not the nice rectangular piece of evidence based innovation that you were looking for, but something that has changed sometimes subtly, sometimes quite radically into what suits that situation because of all the different pressures. We sometimes refer to this as the implementation game because it looks a bit like a, a ball bouncing around a, um, one of these um, uh, one of these machines. Um, but worse than that, the ball doesn't just bounce around the bits inside, it changes shape every time it does. And sometimes when we when we used to give this talk in the good old days, when there were actually people in the room, we'd give them a piece of potty potty to pass around the room and ask the first person to make a model and then see what happens by the time it gets to the end. And it's always changed. And that, I'm afraid, is what happens to the research evidence that we are trying to put into the system. This led us to uh, work with a primary care team and in fact uh, then to do a check in another primary care team elsewhere in the country in a different kind of practice and also in hospitals and uh, medical school and, and so on to see how it is that people think about their decisions. And we came up with this idea of mind lines as opposed to guidelines and mind lines are basically the internalized guidelines that we all carry around in our heads, which are partly tacit, partly based on experience uh, and are reinforced by our chats with our colleagues and with other people and learning from them. And it's, if you like, one person's medical um, mental embodiment of what we like to call knowledge and practice in context, which we always use as one word. Knowledge and practice in context is very different, as I've tried to demonstrate in the previous analogies, very different from the purest research knowledge that we as researchers would like to put out there or we as guideline writers would like to put out there. And the thing about mind lines is that they're very flexible and malleable and, and appropriate to the context. You develop what we have called contextual adroitness, uh, which, is, which is a way of understanding how to use evidence 
all those different types of evidence in the particular context you're working in. But if I were to take you out of that context and put you in another one, so let's say a cardiologist working in London who's suddenly transported to primary care in in uh, in one of these, let's say in, in America, they would struggle because they don't know what the local context is. They don't know what the resources are. They don't know how people think about things. They don't know how to interact with others. They don't know who the experts are locally. And that is all an important part of how you decide what to do with a particular patient in a particular time. A lot of educationists know about the uh, pattern recognition and the, what they call heuristics or illness scripts or rules of thumb that we all learn when we're at medical school and nursing school and so on, uh, the quick ways of doing things. But mindlines are much more complex than that because they take account of far more than the biology and the medical science and the and, and all the, the, the sort of procedures that, that we learn. Uh, and as we get more expert and become contextually adroit, this flexibility and complexity is something that we can do very quickly um, using our mind lines. So what's in a mind line? Well, there's all the stuff that I've just been talking about that you learn when you're when you're training. There's the embedded science, even though when we ask people, um, why did you do that? They don't remember the biochemistry, but it's clearly in there and they wouldn't understand why they're giving it a particular drug if it weren't. They, they know about the guidelines, but they also have their own institutional culture, the values of their peers, the local norms and routines, what they've learned from their teachers, from their own practice and from other people's practice and experience. And all of that, and notice that when we asked, they never actually said the word research, but it's in there. It's in there mixed up in this complex mind line. One mistake we made when we published this was to say guidelines or mind lines, because it was a nice uh, fancy title, but it isn't guidelines or mind lines because guidelines are within the mind lines. They are simply altered in the way of that first WYSI diagram I showed you into something that's appropriate for that context, that knowledge in practicing context that I spoke about. And the evidence sources, I'll keep quiet while you read the slide, they are multiple. And they do include their colleagues and their local opinion leaders. And this Mysterious, they say, that was so often discussed in practice meetings. They say that the best treatment for asthma is, in this context, the best treatment for something, they say. They say that this, this drug has a problem with, along these lines. And you never quite know who they is, but they is very influential, believe me. Again, no mention when we ask people where they got their research from that they knew what it was. It just kind of seeps through all these different sources. We likened this to our compost heap. This was our compost heap uh, once upon a time. Uh, we've moved now. Um, you put all this different stuff into it. Look, personal reflections, what you read in the journals, local benchmarks, study days you go on, integrated care plans and pathways that are sent to you by local organisations, your own experience, your colleagues' experience, the drug reps that come around, the stories and the case studies that you chat about in the coffee room where I sat for hours listening to what was going on and trying to understand how they were talking about things. And all of that, all of that gets beautifully transformed into something magically almost that you can use as knowledge and practice in context embedded and embodied in your mind lines. And that's what mind lines are all about. So we also found when we were looking at, at um, people when they got together in meetings, in the treatment rooms, in the coffee room, etc., that people had their individual mind lines, but also they shared those. And this is a really important feature of, of mind lines and, as you'll see in a moment, of developing communities of practice. So knowledge is shared between people and a collective mind line for a group, for a team, for a, an organisation is formed. And here's the first plug to a, to a book that we've written. And uh, I'm not very good at doing this sort of stuff, plugging my own work. So we move swiftly on to summarise the theory behind mind lines. Basically, research uptake isn't linear. It's not a rational process. We, we often um, told that it 
is or it has been or that it should. But we know now from increasingly um, important pieces of research that it isn't. Research findings are melded with many sources of knowledge. And these are shaped by contextual pressures and tensions and they're transformed into knowledge in practice in context. And that knowledge is used to satisfy many demands. Each actor transforms knowledge that they have. This is really important when we're thinking about implementation. And the actor's varied understandings and needs change the outcome of that piece of implementation work. So the pure piece of research that researchers are always so pleased to have achieved, so proud of, is often changed when it meets the reality of the context, when it lands on the ground of context. Mindlines are individual and they're collective and they embody that process. So I dropped the word communities of practice in there. And this is really important because when we set out to do the piece of work we've been talking about, we were trying to also study communities of practice. And I'm sure many of you know the work of Etienne Wenger and, and his large group of, of colleagues that he's worked with over the decades now. But essentially, a very um, simple definition of a community of practice might be a group of people who share a concern, a set of problems or a passion for a topic. And they want to deepen their understanding and knowledge of that by interacting with people, by learning with people on an ongoing basis. They don't necessarily work together every day, but they get together because they find some value in the interactions that they have as a group, as a community. And as they spend time, they share information, they share insights, they share advice. And through doing that, they begin to solve problems and they help each other. Now, communities of practice are important for a lot of reasons. They get people together, obviously, but they get people together to develop best practice, to implement and, and reshape knowledge. They promote learning. They share collective mind lines. They act as mechanisms for problem solving and as mechanisms for speedily moving knowledge and innovation into practice. And importantly, they give people a feeling of ownership of the changes that are being made in practice. And these are some of the reasons why we use this particular model um, in the east of England at the moment. But they can also be unhelpful. And it's really important to, to draw these things out as well. So they can, they can be so powerfully um, bounded that they block the spread of knowledge beyond those boundaries. So they hold the knowledge themselves and it doesn't permeate um, into other domains. And they also, obviously, if they can spread and develop good practice, they can perpetuate bad practice as well, particularly if the community doesn't have any mechanism for appraising its shared ideas and has a very static membership. So in a minute, you're gonna see a film about how we do things in the east of England. We thought you give, and we give you an opportunity to see something other than us and to hear something other than us. Well, we're here as well in this film and Emily's gonna start it for us in a sec. At the East of England ARC, we make great efforts to implement research into practice. The ARC's job is to do applied research that helps solve problems and improve services using sound, scientifically researched evidence. And the ideal researcher uses co-production methods, working with all the key people who might be expected to use the results in practice. Well, the research may have yielded useful findings, but now what? How will that make a difference in practice? Meanwhile, the practitioner and their organisation have a problem rather like the one the researcher worked on. The ARC, through its close links with both parties, spots the opportunity to apply the research findings. The ARC's implementation team bring together the researcher and the practitioner. They explain their ideas and talk through the possibilities. 
Then the implementation team consider whether the research findings and the organisation meet the ARC's criteria for an implementation project. They think about the potential for implementation and who will need to be involved. If it looks promising, and with the senior executive's blessing, all the key relevant people are invited to form a community of practice. Service users, practitioners, managers, commissioners, whoever matters to making it work. The facilitators ensure there are respectful, critical conversations to help people in the community of practice form relationships, often new ones, that enable them to share their in-depth, first-hand knowledge of the likely implications of the research. So they all learn about the good and the bad points of the research if applied in their context. They collectively explore the likely opportunities and barriers and who else needs to be involved to help the change happen and they agree a plan. As they set about the task for real, they inevitably have to tweak and reshape things, changing the planned implementation of the research to fit the context. They assess how it's going by using success criteria that they themselves have agreed. Usually they realise that they need to adapt things, both in the research findings and the context where the findings are being implemented. The community of practice, who usually meet around four times, continue to check out and adjust things based on their agreed measures of success. This becomes a cycle of small tests of change. Our emphasis on personal and organisation relationships is crucial. The relationships help the key people become more committed to the project and to recognise that adjustments are needed on all sides. They know now that to keep making it work, they need to keep learning from each other, which is what being in a community of practice is all about. They eventually agree that they've sustained the research-based change that was needed. The organisation's performance is improved and the researchers and practitioners, and indeed all the community of practice members, have learned something and made tangible research-based improvements. Everyone's pleased, especially the people who use the service. Every project is different and everybody learns. The implementation team discovers something new each time and spreads these lessons across the ARC growing implementation skills and capacity. Practitioners and service organisations are encouraged to spread not only the research evidence as appropriate, but also the implementation principles they've learned about. And the researchers take the lessons back to their colleagues, so developing more collaborative applied research that can be put into practice. Please get in touch if you want to get involved. So, so far we've talked about the four circles model, we've talked about mind lines and we've talked about communities of practice as the theory parachute. The last thing I want to very briefly talk about uh, before we tell you more about what we do in, in the east of England is what we call softs. This came from some work we were doing to help um, learn what are the skills needed for um, making improvements in the health service. And some work that we did about five or six years ago now or more was that it showed that it's not just about the implementation science type skills, uh, sorry, uh, improvement science type skills that people have talked about, but it was also very much about the soft skills that people have. Um, sorry, these are the these are the uh, technical skills, if you like, but also the soft skills and the way that people learn and whether they learn individually or collectively and whether they learn through reflection and so on. And we devised this idea that it's a bit like a pyramid. You can't get to the top of the pyramid if you only build one wall just using, as the Health Foundation had originally thought we would do, the technical skills in an organisation, but you also need to build these soft skills and this way of learning. Technical skills can also be implementation skills, the sort of thing that comes out of uh, what's these days being called implementation science um, and many, many other theories besides the ones that we've talked about, but it needs more. We've done some more recent work looking at what these skills actually consist of and what we realised was that there are a group of tasks that you have to be able to do, which we've called socio-organisational, functional and facilitative tasks. And you can see why we were aiming for the pun of softs, but it's softs because it's really all about 
a number of things you have to do, like getting the right style and tone in the organization, like managing the huge roller coaster that people are on with so many different imp implementation and improvement initiatives thrust upon them from the top. And it's about making sure you've got the right solution for the right problem. And it's about getting the message across correctly and about helping people to understand that and to put it into their context and enabling them to learn collectively to do that and to make sure that they use their experience in a way that fits the context and all of those skills are very important softs uh, that you need to be inculcating into your community of practice. You need to be drawing on those skills. You need to be making sure you have them uh, to such an extent that we've actually now devised um, a little tool which is going to be trialed shortly uh, or tried out, not, not strictly trialed. Uh, to, to do an audit of an organization before you start to make sure that people have these skills in the team so that they can actually go ahead. I'm going to now quickly talk about some of the projects that we've been doing in the East of England, and then we're going to show you another film uh, which tells you something about how that all worked. Um, We've actually worked now in so that we're now up to nine communities of practice. I'm sorry, I should have updated this slide, but we're only going to be talking about six today uh, in about three minutes. Um, all of them are associated with what, with what many of you will know are the populations in focus in the east of England, which are the um, basically uh, areas of the of the East Anglia and and North Essex, which are underserved and um, need more help in sorting out their services and uh, we focus on them and do most of our research in those areas. The four projects we use, one was about positive behaviour support for, for young people with serious um, problems uh, in terms of their challenging behaviour, uh, enabling them to work at home um, and you'll hear more about that one. Another was a plan to introduce uh, a care plan held by a person in the community uh, which was to be honest uh, clearly never going to work but it was being imposed from the top of the organization and we use the community practice to divert that to make something a little more sensible that was more contextually appropriate we've worked with frailty in the elderly based on research done within the old clerk uh, and as a result of that, an education program to help all the different uh, professionals understand and, and deal with frailty in a, in a collaborative and mutually understood way, which had not been the case before. We're trying to introduce something called Thrive in the uh, care of um, young people with mental health problems in Cambridge and Peterborough, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. Um, and we've set up two communities of practice there, one within the organization, within the trust, the Mental Health Trust, and one of all the partners, the local authority and uh, voluntary sector. Um, another one in East Anglia is uh, the, the, in Norfolk and Suffolk about introducing compassionate communities to help to uh, basically develop death literacy uh, in the community so that we can handle dying much more appropriately given that 95 percent of the care that people get when they are in the last months of their lives uh, does not come from professionals so we're working with local communities there what i'm going to do now is to uh, ask for the film to be shown which will talk uh, have people coming from all of these studies um, telling you a little bit more about what actually happened hello i'm andre lemay and I'm John Gabay, and we work together as the East of England ARCS implementation leads. What's that, you ask? Well, one of the ARCS key roles is to help get research into practice. As the implementation leads, we work alongside people to help them do just that. But enough about us. We thought it best to explain what we do by getting the people we've worked with to tell you all about it. Implementing research is never easy, as this clinical researcher, Rianne Simpson, a consultant geriatrician, will tell you. So I think I think my thoughts were maybe particularly for qualitative research, um, how you implement your findings in today to day practice isn't always easy. Um, and I think as well, research takes a very long time. So when you start, you don't know how long it's going to take. Um, and then there's this big relief when you've published your findings and there's a bit of an anticlimax sometimes as to well, what's going to happen next. 
And I think as well as a clinician, you get funding for your research, but then you don't always get the funding and the time off to do the next bit, which is then to put your findings into practice. And of course, that's the bit you all want to do, because what's the point of doing the research if you, if you can't then do the next phase? Um, so I think having the ARC um, with their expertise and experience for this next phase was really invaluable, particularly as a clinician who'd stopped doing as much research, gone back into clinical practice. Sometimes the organisation is really not ready to accept the need for research-based improvements, as a clinical psychologist Ayla Humphreys explains. So I've been working at improving child and adolescent mental health services with colleagues in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough for close to 15 years. And my previous experience has showed me that um, often it's easy to get going but really difficult to bring in the wider system at the most senior levels, right down to frontline staff in quality improvement initiatives. And then sustaining those changes is also really, really difficult. In fact, I would say in most instances when we've um, implemented quality improvement initiatives in CAMS, very little is retained over the course of years. And in thinking now in our uh, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough CAMS about the waiting lists, which are an ongoing gnarly issue, but really difficult to resolve, wanting to make improvements to reduce, if not eliminate a waiting list, um, I think I felt incredibly um, eager to bring John and Andre in as implementation experts to work alongside myself and my colleagues. Of course, you'd think there might be a more receptive audience for implementing research if it's the very place that the research was done, which is why the ARC, of course, is mostly set up to carry out research that's local and inclusive. But even then, implementation can be hard. As nurse specialist Maria Martin, who, as research fellow in the ARC's predecessor, the Clark, has done some excellent local research, can tell you. So I was actually working in clinical practice and doing the research at the same time. And that was really good and very helpful. And I did want to take the risk findings of the research forward, but I will be honest, I wasn't quite sure how to do that. And it was through the support of the um, implementation leads that I was able to see a path that could help to take the findings from the research, because it was clear from the findings of the research that was done within the trust that um, there were areas where we could improve, but the actual process and method of how we would do that was where I was a little bit unsure because having been a, a clinician and a very new researcher, I'm aware that sometimes the research doesn't always get implemented and I didn't want to lose the um, impetus of we've got this information now what do we do with it? I'm also a pragmatist and I didn't want to do something and then not have it be beneficial. But of course we don't just implement any old research, it needs to be robust and relevant and Maria's research on frailty was certainly that. She along with Rianne Simpson and the Cambridge Institute for Public Health had published a paper about what's called frailty that demonstrated the need for much more comprehensive training of a wide range of staff, which of course meant that to implement it we had to involve them all. We work by bringing together all the relevant people into what we call a community of practice. This just means a group of people who share a concern or a passion about something and they get together regularly to explore better ways of working, discuss any difficulties, help each other find solutions, pool ideas about good practice and generally learn from each other how best to make things work. And that's really all about creating a comfortable environment where people can learn and create a shared sense of identity and of ownership and of commitment to their common cause. Roland Casson, helping lead another COP, put it like this. Siloed, really. And I, I, I feel that, that actually there was a lot of kind of really creative conversations and a real kind of willingness for people to, to think beyond, beyond what they do at the moment and, and kind of dream. But it needs to be all the right people, which isn't just the staff, is it? No, definitely not. I guess we ought to call it inclusive implementation. Yeah, something like that. Here's Maria Martin again. We had the introduction of the 
implementation leads who were very helpful in facilitating a community practice event where we had representatives from all staff groups within the older people and adult care group in CPFT. And we were very lucky to have a gentleman who came along as a, our patient and public involvement representative. That was um, really helpful in providing the um, perspective of the carer or patient to this because we were looking to develop training for staff that would enable the staff to be um, that would enable um, the staff to understand frailty as a concept and how it best can be addressed by having the care and patient perspective we were able to ensure a 360 degree um, look at this topic it also means that when we went to develop the training, we've actually developed it to three levels. And the first level, although it is initially applicable to staff, will also be hopefully open to carers and patients to look at so that they can understand what this may mean for them. Um, especially if they're going to look at having conversations with staff about what they would like to happen about their care, maybe if the situation changes in the future. And Ruth Sapset tells us here how it felt for a voluntary sector representative in one community of practice to improve mental health services for young people. So I joined in with this work because I am working with the Full Scope Consortia, which is a consortia of voluntary organisations working to support children and young people's mental health and well-being in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. I run an arts and well-being charity called Cambridge Curiosity and Imagination. And we historically have a really strong track record of working closely with younger children, primary schools, early years settings, and kind of wider community development projects, but less so in terms of working closely with colleagues who work in mental health. So this was a really interesting opportunity, I think, for me and from the organisation and the artists and the colleagues I work with to really appreciate the sort of scale and complexity of the system that families and children are trying to navigate and of course colleagues too and I was really struck by that in the meeting with John that I came along to. Um, I really came away from it having had a sense of a real insight into other perspectives that was really useful to hear other perspectives but I think what it was important the benefit I felt from it was the, that sense of, of us working towards a shared language and a sort of shared sense of values about what we wanted to see different for children and young people and their families. Guy Perrier, an ARC researcher on the end of life care, is trying to establish what are called compassionate communities in Norfolk and Suffolk. This is a well evidence method for enabling neighbours and family members to help each other when someone's dying and to implement it, Guy asked us to develop local communities of practice. Communities of practice as a model is new to me. Um, however, I can see the direct relevance to the project I'm involved with, which is essentially about relations. And it's a community based intervention It's about community development and it's about sharing power between clinical um, organisations and members of the public. So I think this is my first experience of trying to establish and maintain a community of practice that is entirely citizen led, but also dovetails with clinical practice. So I think that there's innovative elements with this project and it's very much in line with um, requests from, uh, from the NHS about, about what we should be doing. So what Ruth and Guy have highlighted there is the absolute emphasis we put on the relational aspect of implementation. It's about making it possible for everyone to learn about each other's concerns, as well as their enthusiasms, and to plan an implementation strategy that they all feel can be and will be achieved, which of course usually means tweaking the research findings to suit the context. Now, achieving that open relationship is key. Here's the psychologist Ayla Humphrey again, an ARC researcher, as well as a practitioner and manager. Well, I have an interest in implementation and I've published a couple of papers relating to CAMS and quality improvement initiatives and how we implement those. Um, yeah, I don't know if this is going to sound exactly like what you want to hear, but um, there's no magic. So I think I expected that translation would and, and that you guys would bring some kind of special magic to the whole thing. 
and um and it really is just about human communication it's it, it really is about um listening to each other making each other feel safe i think having somebody almost like a therapist from the outside who's um who, who's the watching and listening reflecting back um these are the you know these are the things that are the bread and butter of what i do in my work as a psychologist so um yeah so it's in a way it's reassuring because it shows me that you know some of the basic skills that we already have as psychologists and as um yeah i'll just speak for psychology for the time being they're there for us to use um but but i think being part of the family if you will can make it hard sometimes to initiate change from within uh, without having that external um point of view so while the key to implementation is fostering the right relationships it's also useful to help from the arc which is an outside um which is outside local internal politics and interests back to rianne simpson um, I think another role of the implementation team is to be that link really in within and particularly an NHS organisation with managers and other stakeholders um, and to have that more strategic overview that if within an organisation you need to make change that you're almost advocating for the research team to, to build change within within a big organisation and I think that's also an important role um, of the team as well. So certainly for me it's been complete really invaluable working uh, with you and um, and you know I've, I've learned a lot from your approach and, and um, just within that first communities of practice uh, you know meeting and how you approached it and and so I've learned a lot already but I would hope to say in the future we'll have some opportunity to work again as well. Frontline staff may need help in putting across their concerns about implementing research that in senior managers are insisting on. Marina Buswell, who was working for the local commissioners in Stevenage, picks up just such a story. A couple of years ago, you were involved in a community of practice helping um, a prescribed rollout of a care planning document in Eastern North Hearts. Um, and what it really enabled me to do as an NHS manager at the time was to be evaluative about the process rather than have to rush headlong into it. So I know there'd been some misgivings with some staff groups about this um, document, but there were also really high expectations around it. And I'd got a group of people, different staff groups and different organisations that were trying to implement this care planning document. So you work with us to form a community of practice around um, those people. And it just really gave us space to think through what was happening, to plan what was happening and to record what happened when we did that and i think having external people facilitate it made a massive difference to the conversations we could have in in those groups and then it also validated the findings we had so i was able to take these findings which were validated by external researchers if you like to senior directors and managers and to tell them well this didn't work in this way and this is why we think it didn't work and there was a couple of places where it did work really well and this is why we think it worked well in those places part of it is about enabling frontline staff and managers in each cop to decide their own success criteria for the implementation and as roland casson puts it i guess the intention was to bring together key stakeholders in Peterborough to really think about how how we could use that resource well in Peterborough and how that might be different. You, you know, obviously the context is different from what we had been working in Cambridgeshire. Uh, in terms of kind of trying to identify who the key stakeholders were, but also to try and define what good would look like and how we would, yeah, ha how we would know that we would achieved good. Uh, obviously, we're a really limited resource, we're a very small team. Um, and I think it was, but from our perspective, it was really helpful that we had kind of independent uh, facilitators who could be curious and to, to uh, be positive and interested in the history of how services have developed in Peterborough, um, but really be focused on actually kind of 
trying to define what good would look like rather than being drawn into kind of local politics. Roland's in describing how we helped him implement his Clark research in Peterborough. He had shown that using a method called positive behaviour support, or PBS, you could improve care and save hundreds of thousands of pounds. What's not to like? Well, you'd be surprised. But after we'd sidestepped any local resistance, so successful was PBS that just before the first COVID lockdown, Roland ran a countywide meeting of about 50 people where we used community of practice principles to explain the benefits of PBS. I think what we had from that from that community of practice is, is really just people's commitment to to, to doing something um, and, and using it, it felt like a really energized event where people um, did, did want to create something different. So I think we've, we've got that on hold to pick up as, as kind of restrictions lift. But I, th I think our feeling was that if we're going to achieve anything, we need we need we need to be in a room together because I think it was something quite different from 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 usual practice and something yeah. where people, those kind of relationships haven't been forged in, in, in a way that's going to work virtually. But maybe he's wrong about using online meetings. We've run all of Ayla's COPs remotely and here's her take on Zoom-based COPs. I thought, I thought it was going to be, I wouldn't say a disaster, but I was really worried about it. And, um, and I actually wonder if it's helped in some ways that, um, we're, we're not sitting in, in the room and as as cued into each other's body language, all the nonverbal stuff. I think in some ways it's easier to focus on the words. Um, so it hasn't in any way um, gotten in the way, I think, of the work from, from my experience of it. People seem really comfortable. Um, and I think Personally, I have felt it's it's an easier endeavor than sitting in the room with everybody. Maybe that's a cop out, no pun intended. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid she does call them cops. But there we have it. Six COPs and COVID or no COVID, two COPs in Peterborough and Cambridge of transforming the care of young people with mental health problems. And one's already done so for those with challenging behavior. One COP is reshaping the care of frail older people there too. And one helped avoid a potentially disastrous rollout of a care planning document in Stevenage. And one is helping whole local communities in Norfolk and Suffolk cope more positively with death and dying. So we have commissioned Rand Europe to do a quick, formal, independent evaluation of this implementation to see if we're on the right lines. But so far, for the COPs, it seems the news is good. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much, um, both of you, for your valuable insights. Um, people really valued all of those contributions, all of the tools and ideas, and there's been lots of requests for your insights to be shared, and Carrie's shared many of them. Now, I know we don't have very long for uh, questions, and most of the feedback provided was how helpful your insights and, and expertise have been um, but there were a few sort of questions that emerged or comments that emerged and I'm just going to summarize them because I think you'll probably only have a chance to respond to whichever you think is most relevant in the time frame so the first area was around um, Harriet Cooper was asking about hierarchies of evidence and, and how you have you ever focused on the hierarchies of evidence and how you manage the different types of evidence from social cultural and lived knowledge in terms of education. That was one sort of question. Then there was a sort of second theme uh, around um, managing the dissonance, helping our students to learn about the realities of practice. And there were suggestions about how joint appointments might help. And that really came back to the skill set of those facilitators in your communities of practice. What was the skill set? Were they researchers themselves? And what are the key skills required to help these uh, practitioners to challenge their assumptions, not take things for granted, and um, and challenge some of the boundaries. And then there were uh, there was a third, and that also linked in with the mind lines. And then there was a sort of third area, which was around um, sustaining initiatives. We heard some brilliant examples of impact. Um, and, and, and in your first video, I think you talked about sustaining, but a little bit more information about how you help people to sustain their innovations and implementation in practice. And that's just a really brief summary of some of the things that came up. There may be others that are really important that I haven't mentioned. Mm.
Great, thank you very much. We were watching the questions as they rolled in and thinking, gosh, how are we going to manage all of those? In the very short time, I apologise, we've allowed you. There, there is email, as I said before. So Harriet, uh, your question about hierarchies uh, and, and everything else that went in there, I think that is around the facilitation skills of the people who, who are doing that. And as we said before, we have a model which is very much about respectful, robust conversations and allowing people to have those. Um, so that is in the drawing out First of all, the fact that there are some ground rules, that it is about a safe space, that not everybody will think in the same way. And, and often that will be to do with our context, our professional cultures, our personal cultures, etc. So it is about getting to know each other and, and being comfortable to, to ask awkward questions, to be critical, but also to celebrate together because that's a really important part of um, developing that that kind of respectful environment. Um, I, I got a comment about professional hierarchies, which doesn't come from this study, but something I've learned over the years in that we all have um, espoused professional hierarchies and we live them. But sometimes when you question people about what they actually do and what they think in a more open way, they'll say, oh, that's the one, that's my show. That's what I'm showing you. But really underneath, I believe X, Y and Z. And so in facilitation, you have to get to that place. Now, I just want to say some people will be facilitating things differently to the way that I do or the way that John does or that we both do. And it's about over a period of time building those skills and that confidence as a facilitator. So you asked how we do that. We try to do that through the fellowship programme, the implementation fellowships we have here. We try to do that through example. Um, and we recognise that it is something that will be developed over time. So that's also about finding other role models than us. Uh, there was a question about success criteria, and I think you probably got the answer from Roland Casson in the in the video that the success criteria have to be set by the group themselves uh, in, in the way that we work um, so that they can know what they're trying to achieve and they can see how well they're getting towards it by using small tests of change. And that's that's a very important part of our way of doing things. And again, it's all based on the idea of respectful, critical conversations that, that we try to engender in these groups so that they all feel able to appraise each other's things thinking, um, criticise it in, 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 a, in a good way and make sure that we're getting towards the aim that they've all agreed uh, in that context. Another question was about group think, just to say, again, that's all about the facilitation. It's all about making sure that people are able to be critical rather than having the kind of convergent conversation where everybody approaches to everyone. Um, uh, to, to everyone else's view. And, and the other thing is we, we use language like small tests of change. By using those sort of terms, it suggests that we're formalising a lot of things. It, it doesn't need to be formalised. Some of these things are, are formative and very informal as well as summative and more formal. Yeah, absolutely. Links to an embedded research and mod model. Some some of you asked if we uh, if the facilitators were researchers as well. In this instance, the facilitators were researchers as well, because obviously the majority of the facilitation is done by John and me, which actually puts us in a very positive position because we understand the language of research, the language of facilitation, and the language of implementation. So we hope we've given you through giving you a theoretical parachute, something that you can really get your teeth into that has practical real impact. Thank you so much for being there and Thank listening you. to us. Thank you, uh, John and Andre. That was an absolutely fantastic webinar and there's been loads of discussion as you've seen. Um, thank you for uh, answering the question so eloquently. Um, and we will make sure that a recording of the webinar and the links to the films are available on YouTube for the end of the week. So thank you very much to our audience. If I could just ask John and Andre to stay on the call with us and we'll say goodbye to everybody else. And thank you so much for your participation and your lovely comments. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.